as we'd like to welcome you to uh, what is just one of a series of events planned in honor of Black History Month. We appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedules to be here with us and hope that you will attend some other events this month as well. Um, we are indeed honored and privileged to have with us three uh, legends of the civil rights movement, three women who have been very active in the ongoing struggle for justice. And it is indeed an honor for me to introduce them and you are in for an intellectual treat. Uh, we will start with um, Professor Angeline Butler, and after Professor Butler, we will hear from uh, Muriel Tillinghouse, and then lastly, we will hear from uh, Dorothy Z uh, Zellner. And at the conclusion of their presentations, there will be a brief uh, opportunity for you to uh, make comments or ask questions. So don't be shy. After our third presenter, you can come right up to the mic. Uh, and again, we are glad that you're here. And without further ado, Angeline. Thank you. Welcome to the community hour. <laughs> um, the film you've been looking at, The Nashville Sit-In, was the very first documentary ever made on the sit-in movement in 1960 by NBC. And when you see today uh, the CBS specials, you see the Mississippi Freedom Riders, you see uh, Eyes on the Prize, the footage, much of the footage that you see is still from this original film uh, that NBC owns the footage too, because there is no other footage, okay? Bob Young, uh, the famous filmmaker, made this particular film. And um, we do have a copy here in the library, which I had donated uh, last year. So you can view it. It's called NBC White Paper Number Two, Sit-In, 1960. Now, I wanna begin because the theme today was women and activism. And uh, basically, I wanted to begin with uh, a kind of a historical on that, because I think that a lot of people, they really don't know, you know, how we um, came to the point uh, where we were. For instance, um, back in slavery time, you know, the image of blacks was so negative, they thought we had no intellect, that we were inferior beings, and even uh, cases went all the way up to the Supreme Court, and that, thought was sanctioned. So one of the uh, important uh, early activists, in my opinion, would be um, uh, Phyllis Wheatley. And uh, Phyllis Wheatley, because she was a slave that was uh, seized from Gambia. And uh, she was only seven years old, and she, all she had was like a dirty carpet rank, uh, you know, wrapped around her. And uh, she was brought to New England, and uh, by the time she was 18 years old, she uh, was lucky that she ended up with a good family in New England, and she became a poet, and she had written some 28 poems. And uh, that was important to us because uh, she becomes the abolitionist illustrative testimony that African Americans can be both artistic and intellectual. And uh, in her famous poem, Liberty and Peace, which hails American uh, victorious over Britannica law. Uh, the tail end of it goes this way, just to give you a sample of her writing. Uh, Britannica owns her heavenly reigns. Auspicious heaven shall fill in favoring, with favoring gales. Wherever Columbia spreads, her sw a swelling sails to every realm shall peace her charges display and heavenly freedom spread the golden ray. Now, uh, this poem uh, is illustrating basically the beginning of the power of our words as tools for getting out our messages. And here she is changing people's opinion about her just through her writings. Harriet Tubman, to me, was central uh, as an activist. And uh, she was, uh, how many people know Harriet Tubman? Okay, Harriet Tubman uh, had a $40,000 reward on her head by the time she was, uh, you know, uh, 1856. And that was the Underground Railroad. And that organization uh, basically escorted over 350,000 people out of like Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, 
and they escorted them to the west as well as the north. And um, Harriet Tubman actually um, personally uh, escorted over 300 people. She went back and forth to the south first to rescue her family and then she rescued other people that were interested. Uh, Mary McLeod Bethune to me comes to mind and uh, she comes to my mind because uh, she walked to school seven miles a day just to learn how to read and write and she was from South Carolina and uh, when she was uh, uh, literate and uh, somewhat educated she founded a Daytona school for Negro girls and that later became Bethune-Cookman University, and that's in Florida, okay? Now, um, she's a contemporary of Booker T. Washington, and Booker T. Washington was at the same time at the Tuskegee Institute. But it's such a great thing knowing that there was a black woman creating education for, quote, Negro girls. The curriculum was basically uh, a re reading, writing, and arithmetic, and they studied uh, Latin. How many people study Latin? <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, um, she was uh, also the founder of the National Association of Negro Women, striving to improve the quality of their lives and their families and their work and their opportunities um, as African Americans. Now, later on, you may have known uh, the Congressional Medal in the last few years before Dorothy Height died, she was the person who served for many years as the president of that organization, which is still contemporary. Septima Poinsett Clark, to me, is outstanding in my memory because not only did I know her um, and work with her at the Highlander Folk School, but um, she was an educator who lost her job uh, at the, in, in, in Charleston for, believe it or not, in 19... 54 for admitting membership in the NAACP. Is that unbelievable? <laughs> she and 40 other teachers from the Calhoun County Schools lost their jobs and she could never ever get a job in the public uh, or state school again. And um, she was also um, traditionally the first black, uh, one of the first black teachers that were teaching black students because at that time you had these mission schools, you had the Presbyterians, you had the Episcopals teach white people who went to the South to try to uh, provide church schools for black children. Now, um, of course, there was a time before that when it was against the law to teach any black person to read or write. Now, when Septima um, was, e was expelled from the state school system, she um, had been working in citizenship. And that is so important to us because there were many, many uh, black people who were not educated enough to, let's say, write a check or, let's say, fill out a simple income tax form at that time. Um, you know, you gotta remember that slavery was less than 100 years away and while people had made great strides, they had not yet arrived in terms of education. So she went back and she taught people to read and write. And her goal was to teach people to read at least 135 words per minute. How many people can read 135 words per minute? Just put your hands up. <laughs> not many people, right? <laughs> you know? But that was her goal. And one summer, um, she was in, um, uh, in, in, in uh, Atlanta University and W.B. Du Bois was teaching a class called uh, Human Relationships. And Septima uh, was used to getting on the bus and going to the black section of the bus to transport herself to work. She always hated doing that, but not to obey the law at that time or the practice meant going to jail. So she tells us this story um, of one morning um, how she was, boarded a, 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 tr a trolley car and this mother comes on with this little boy and he's only about six years old and he takes the seat behind the bus driver 
and she can see from the back of the bus that his mother, her mother said, oh, no, 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 no. You can't sit there. Come on back. Come on back here. You can't sit there. The little boy refuses to move, and he says, no, mama. He says, I's mama's little man. I can sit up to the front. Well, of course, his mother had to go and physically move the little boy, and of course, it brought him many tears. And Septima Clark at, uh, moved into Highlander Folk School with these citizenship schools, and there she met Rosa Parks, who also was the secretary for the NAACP in Montgomery, Alabama. So they came to Highlander Folk School to try to find out what Ms. Clark wanted them to do back in Alabama. And they became literally uh, teachers in the program where they were training people to read and write and to read in cursive writing those portions of the Constitution that were necessary for them to go down and register and vote. How did they teach them? They taught them using the Bible, something that people already knew because everybody went to the church. And they uh, set up brown paper cleaning bags to write on as their blackboards. And they were very successful. And over a period of time, with the efforts of Septima Poinsett Clark, um, Edie Nixon, Rosa Parks, uh, Ella Baker, they actually uh, registered over 350,000 voters in the South. Now they had 12, they had, they worked in all Southern states. They had over 2,000 teachers. And when they meant teachers, they weren't necessarily teachers that had college education. They could be teachers that had a literacy uh, level of, let's say, eighth grade, barbershop workers, people in the community. Um, it wasn't required that you finish high school at that point. And, but people who could read and write, who could teach other people to read and write. And they were very successful. And we have to look at what they did as being um, uh, the most important contribution to the fact that we've got all these elected people today in the Congress, in the state senates, the, the local legislature. Because when Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which is my group, and of course we all went to jail a lot during the 60s, which this film documents. Um, when we, uh, you know, uh, uh, had our programs throughout the South, the main focus was voter registration and literacy. So Goodman, Cheney, Severna, young people your age working in the South lost their lives because they we're trying to get people to register to vote. I'm Angeline Butler. We'll continue the discussion. Good afternoon. I'm Muriel Tellinghast, and I guess I am going to talk to you more about my work as a field secretary for the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Um, I just want you to know that once upon a time, I was your age. <laughs> And um, I had had some um, experiences pr uh, prior to engaging in the civil rights movement that had to do with class issues. I was raised in Washington, D.C., and I became familiar with tenant farming on the eastern shore of Maryland as a young person. And I had gone to my church um, minister, well, we were at a regional conference, and I had seen this M uh, NBC white paper. And I said, uh, it was called Harvest of Shame, which you can look up. It's uh, definitely available. And I was absolutely floored by the conditions that I saw people living in. And so I went to this minister, and I asked him if there was something that we could do about it. Well, fast forwarding, several months later, he came back to me and told me that no, because he had had plenty of shotguns in his face telling him, uh, Father, you have no business taking care of this business. This is my business and get off my land. These were his parishioners. I began to understand that everything that I thought was, um, well, I guess you could say, uh, I hate to use the expression apple pie. Uh, I wasn't that idealistic, but certainly um, <sighs> worth uh, considering I didn't realize that there were underbellies to almost all of these social conditions. 
moving along at around 17, I went to Howard and uh, in my, uh, I was a working student. Uh, in my second year, I ran into a group of people from the Nonviolent Action Group, and they were an interesting group of people. They looked different from everybody else. They talked different from everybody else. They took on everybody. You know, if a teacher was in class and said something out of whack or an error, you could rest assured a hand was going to go up and a challenge was going to go on the table. And I liked that. And um, so over time, we became friendly, and I began to understand that these people were put together around a variety of things, including looking and seeing, not looking and not seeing, hearing, learning, digging, a lot of reading, a lot of discussion. Um, at Howard, we had um, the building of um, a major construction project for which not one black person was uh, hired, and that, uh, that was one of the things that we took on. We also had a lot of other things going on simultaneously. Um, you might uh, appreciate the fact that the institution uh, was a little nervous around us, and in some cases just downright hostile. Uh, a lot of our teachers were dragged into kangaroo court. Some people went, uh, some people lost employment um, as a result of um, encouraging us to be um, a challenging force. When I learned that there was going to be a summer program, it was called, well, we called it the call. If you were part of an organization, word of mouth was you were gonna know that something was going on in Mississippi in 1964, and if you were a committed person, then you were expected to show up. Um, when I was at Howard, NAG literally broke up. We were all going to go to Mississippi. And that was a rather interesting kind of transition because my mother had taught in Mississippi and hated the place. And um, when I was getting ready to go to Mississippi, I hadn't asked permission. I was, you know, one of those kind of students. I was packing my, book, my books in, in the hall and my mother said, where are you going? I said, I'm going to Mississippi. She said, what? And I said, oh yeah, well, you know, Carmichael's going and all my friends are going, so I'm gonna go. My mother said, you know, really. Um, to make a long story short, um, we had an orientation in Ohio. That gave me some indication of the fact that this was really a very sobering experience. This was not gonna be fun at all. And in fact, we did not know whether we were going to survive the experience. Uh, Mississippi had been historically a very hostile place for black people and slavery. That is where um, slaves that were recalcitrant, that were difficult for slave masters to handle, that's where the slaves ended up. Mississippi said, send them down here, we can handle it. Um, just to give you some idea of the, the seriousness of the process, when we were on the bus coming out of Ohio into Mississippi, we were gabbing and talking and people were singing and we sang a lot of songs. The songs were very much like, um, you know, the mayonnaise and the sandwich of the movement, if you could go with that analogy. And as soon as we hit the state line, the bus just got silent, you know, and people were being dropped off in various predetermined places in the shadows of the night. I mean, it was such an eerie scene uh, coming off of those buses, but um, there had been um, planning and people basically faded into the Mississippi night, which by the way is a very beautiful night. You know, the stars are very, you know, pronounced in the southern part of the country, but we also know that Mississippi used that night many ways to keep black people um, under basically the lash. I uh, was dropped off in Greenville, which is on the river. I could look right straight across the river to Arkansas. Arkansas is basically the stepsister to Mississippi. Whatever Mississippi missed, Arkansas got. And they shared the same kind of attitude. They say shared the same kind of prison system. Um, they shared um, an agrarian base, uh, which largely kept uh, black people um, in an agrarian manner. Now, some of you won't uh, appreciate this. We're not talking about farmers. We are talking about plantations, which have not varied much since the Civil War. And plantations are private property, and when you were trying to get people to register to vote, you really need to see them in an environment that is closest to what they find a high, higher comfort level. 
So sometimes we were on people's plantations and sometimes people got runoffs. Sometimes people got uh, jacked up and you know what that expression means. And um, I'll to, to make a long story short, the plantations were one of the sources where we uh, pulled people into the um, development of the movement. Our movement wasn't really made of wealthy people or people who were middle class. Our movement was made of people who were poor, who were peasants. Many of them were tenant farmers themselves. There were sprinkling of other people, but by and large, I would say that um, one of the things that I began to appreciate was the, the honor and the dignity of the poor that I had really never seen before. Um, now, I ran three river counties, uh, Issaquina, Sharkey, and uh, Washington County. And my friend, Cynthia Washington, ran Bolivar County up above me. There were three um, of us women who were project directors in Mississippi. And you got to be a project director because you were pretty tough. You know, um, you didn't really take too much and uh, you could galvanize your crew and you could get things done. Um, now, uh, one of the girls who ran a project in Yazoo City was constantly getting burned down. Every time I looked, she, heard, she was having to move because the Klan was just adamant and active with regard to trying to close her up. I didn't have that problem in Greenville. Issaquina, Issaquina was a very interesting county. It was a county that had been developed by black free slaves, but they didn't have any representation in the political system, which is rather interesting. When we started doing voter registration and going through the, tax, uh, going through the voter rolls and we actually had an opportunity to see people's names, a lot of those names were people that came straight out of the cemetery. Those the people did not exist. But that was a way by which the white power structure maintained its control. Um, I worked out of a little town called Myersville, which couldn't have had more than 15 houses in it, but that was the center of the county.